when I moved to Boston, I started collecting old vinyl records. Of course, I list, I had records when I was a kid. Yeah. But at, at in the 90s in Boston, you could pick up vinyl for like three for a buck. You know, it was dirt cheap. So I used to go into the record stores and pick up any old weird looking album, usually from the 50s, 40s through the 60s. And I built a big collection of country and Western music. And then I made a couple of CDs I called Western Blues and was giving those out for Christmas presents. And I actually have a <laughs> Spotify, I have a Spotify playlist that's 29 hours long now with 600 songs on it that I've collected for 40 years. My wife and I listen to it a lot in the car. It's real good driving music, you know, and I'm going to just list some of the characters that I listen to. You're familiar with all these guys, but a lot of people watching and listening won't be, and they should be. Uh, there's Hank Williams, of course. Bill Monroe and his Kentucky Boys. Coulter Wall's a new guy from Saskatchewan. Oh, yeah. He's a great young... Yeah, he's great. Uh, um, my son played one of his songs to open my lectures for 11 shows this year. That was really fun. Um, Johnny Horton, uh, Tex Ritter, Hank Snow, Flat and Scruggs, the Carter family, Jimmy Rogers, the Stanley Brothers, Roy Acuff, Roy Acuff. Hackberry Ramblers, Gypsy Kings, Leon Redbone, etc. Tammy and I, my wife, we've just watched the Ken Burns country music documentary, which is absolutely great. It's just brilliant. Eight two-hour episodes. And I've done a couple of shows at the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville. So that was fun. There's a great bar there called Robert's Western World that I go to when I go down to Nashville. And they have a band there called Kelly's Heroes. They did some music for me at the Grand Ole Opry, uh, played a vicious rendition of the American National Anthem on electric guitar. Um, and uh, they do a great, uh, they do a great version of Ghost Riders in the Sky, great blues guitar version of Ghost Riders in the Sky. So anyways, I thought I'd tell you that just <laughs> so you know that I'm not a Johnny come lately to the, to the kind of music that you've been playing. And so. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah, that's yeah, very, yeah. um, very in like with with my listening, so uh, I love the a lot of the older music and older blues like Delta Blues and that type of thing. But yeah, that's uh, I, I wouldn't have guessed that about you. So that's that's good to know. Yeah, it's it's uh, yeah. Well, about I about a quarter of this Spotify playlist is Delta Blues too, because there's a great overlap right between between the that Delta Blues tradition and the kind of music that you're interested in and. And it, it's a, you said that too. I saw that really portrayed well, for example. I don't know if you've seen the new Elvis movie, a relatively new Elvis movie, which I thought was great, but it does a lovely job of laying out the relationship between that black blues tradition and uh, Western country and we tradition. You know, it's not mm -hmm. a, it's not a connection that people often make, but there's, there's a real sync there in terms of musical genre, nice interplay between the different musical forms. So cool to see. And, course we're all the beneficiaries of that you know yeah that and so there's american musical tradition so some, something you may look at adding to your playlist or looking up that i think you'd find interesting is um it, i don't know who the group is in the video but if you go on youtube it's called carpathian folk music and uh, it's usually the first video to pull up under carpathian folk music and it's maybe i want to say it's about 45 minutes long and it goes oh okay and it 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 plays out almost like a symphony like it starts it starts in sort of one element and then it, it has its ups and downs. And, um, I've listened to that thing <laughs> 200 times, you know, it's like, hmm. uh, sitting out in the woods, listening to that. It's, it, it, it takes you on a ride almost the way like Beethoven would, but it's, it reminds me kind of almost a lot of the older country and blues. It's, it's a very weird, it's a very weird element, but it's got a lot of the sort of bluegrass elements to it, fiddle and uh, upright bass and stuff mm -hmm. like that. You ought to check it out, the Carpathian folk music. I, I, think I, will, like that. I will 100 <laughs> I will one hundred percent check that out. Yeah, you know, one of the things that's really quite a mystery about music, and I, I can't quite figure it out, is, you know, I like classical music. I listen to a lot of music in the car. Classical music's hard to listen to in a car because it's got such an immense dy dynamic range. But... You no, know, classical music is obviously extremely sophisticated and complex and brilliant and, 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 you know, reaches up into this stratosphere of genius. But there's dead simple music 
that manages exactly the same thing. I mean, Johnny Cash is a great example of that because, well, in the Ken Burns documentary, you find out when Johnny Cash first started, I mean, his musicians could barely play at all. You know, they knew like three <laughs> chords. Of course, the Sex Pistols were like that too. And weirdly enough, and I don't get this exactly, is that there's there's a one of the hallmarks of musical genius is authenticity and genuineness, right? So you can take a really simple melody and you can do something stunningly brilliant with it. Hank Williams is great at that. And it gives it a depth that's timeless, right? It it doesn't it doesn't age, uh, well, which is what timeless means, of course. But I, and I, it has to be something like that, genuineness, and it must be something like that that sparked the imagination of people around your song, right? Because when I was listening to it, I listened to it a couple of times this morning just to refamiliarize myself with it before we talked. And you have a genuineness of voice that has obviously struck a chord. And so, while I'm curious about that is, first of all, I'm really curious about how you're doing because you've been <laughs> like the center of a media firestorm here in the last couple of weeks, and that must be shocking to you. What's that been like? And why do you think your song, what is it about your song that you think you did right that that it contributed to its going viral? Hmm. So I, I have taken time to try to, to understand that myself. Um, you know, the song, the song skyrocketed in a way that it, it I, you know, there's been accusations that it was that it was propped up, you know, almost that I'm an industry plant because it it was like we posted the song on on um, we recorded it on a on a Saturday. I think he uploaded it on Tuesday. And by Thursday, man, it, we were we were on a roller coaster ride. Like it was already apparent that things were going were heading in a direction that nothing else on his channel had done previously. Radio WV, um, and yeah, I mean, I guess to answer the first part of your question, how I'm doing, I'm su surprisingly very calm. Like um, I, I have, <laughs> I've been entertained the last couple weeks. I've been given sort of an unfair advantage of how the internet works and how how narratives are spread in certain directions to, you know, people form opinions about things like, for example, me playing the Super Bowl. You know, I've gotten um, I've gotten a lot of comments and messages saying that I'm a sellout, that I've decided to sing at the Super Bowl. But that was just an Internet meme that someone created on Facebook. Uh, like, for example, the one the one that popped up yesterday was that. Um, Oliver Anthony stuck at Burning Man and people were sending me stuff telling oh, yeah. <laughs> me how terrible it was that I'm at this like, oh, you know, Burning Man's this satanic ritual place and you shouldn't be there. And it, like, but, the, but it's, you know, so I, I uploaded a video of me hanging out with my goats in the woods. Like, yeah, man, Burning Man, it really, <laughs> it's a red, you know, it's terrible being stuck at Burning Man. But, um, so I don't know. I, I, I try not to take myself so seriously and I've tried not to take this situation so mm. seriously. It's just, um, it's, I, I'm blessed for the opportunity to be here. I mean, even just being able to have a conversation with you is surreal. Uh, meeting Joe Rogan was surreal. Just, um, the artists that I've looked up to like Jamie Johnson and Shooter Jennings. And it's just so weird that, that they're a phone call away now. Uh, so, um, I'm, I'm doing well. Like I, I, you know, as I'm sure, you know, like my, the last couple of years haven't been so great for me anyway, as far as my own, um, my own perception on life. And so this is exciting to have a new opportunity to, to dive into. It's what I've been, it's re really what I've been wanting to do for a long time. I've just been so terrified of the idea of doing it, but here, here I am, like, there's no, there's no going back now, I guess. So. Yeah. Well, that's actually something I wanted to talk to you about. Cause I was reading when I was doing some background research on you, I, and this is relevant to the issue of selling out that you brought up. So, you know, I've worked with a lot of artists and I've worked with a lot of wannabe artists too, you know, or at least had contact with them. And one of the things I've really noticed is that many of the people I've met who are extremely artistically talented shoot themselves in the foot on the commercial side of things. And they do that in three ways. The first is, four ways. The first is they're actually terrified of commercial success. And that's actually understandable because along with commercial success comes a transformation in, in lifestyle and in social positioning. 
And it's easy to be leery of that, and there's some utility in that, especially if you're a private person, you know. And But then there's ideological issues that come up too. So it's the issue of selling out is a really relevant one. You know, lots of artists will refuse to have anything to do with the commercial end of their enterprise because they're afraid that that will interfere with the flourishing of their artistic spirit. And that that's foolish. And it's foolish for a bunch of reasons. Like, first of all, why create unless people have access to what you create? I mean, maybe you enjoy it yourself, and that would be perfectly the case, for example, with music. But, you know, if you're a performer, in principle, you want people to well, hear what you have to perform, and partly so they can enjoy it, partly so you can get feedback, so you can get better. And so you actually want to bring it, your work to the attention of as many people as possible. The people who bitch and moan about selling out most loudly are almost always people who've had no opportunity to sell out. Like, no one's ever offered them the chance to be commercially successful. And so what they do is they elevate their moral stance um, falsely by claiming that they're the sort of people that would never fall prey to any capitalist temptations, when the truth is they're not talented enough or interesting enough for anyone to ever offer them that possibility And then the other thing that creative people do that's a really big problem is they don't construe the marketing end, the communication end, as another creative challenge. You know, so if you're a creative person, you actually overlap with people who have entrepreneurial interests temperamentally. But one of the things you can do if you're creative, and this stops you from selling out, is to understand that the venture of marketing yourself and presenting yourself and developing a professional persona, and also learning how to buffer yourself against the negative consequences of that is also a creative challenge. You know, because you might ask, any creative person might ask, well, if I was going to handle the problem of being successful creatively, how would I do that? And then it becomes another creative problem instead of like an antithesis between, let's say, the selling out capitalism that would warp your, you know, your creative spirit and and the creative spirit itself. (music) 